hear ye, hear ye, hear ye. The special session of the District Court of Ramsey County is now open pursuant to adjournment. The Honorable Leonardo Castro presiding. Thank you, Deputy, for opening up this special session of court. And good afternoon, everyone. On behalf of the judges and referees of the Second Judicial District in Ramsey County, I want to welcome you to this special session and thank you for attending. This is the second remote memorial session we have now conducted. And although we would rather be gathering in person where we can shake hands, give a hug, and share a story, I'm grateful that we have managed to maintain this important memorial tradition here in Ramsey County. The leadership of the Ramsey County Bar Association fully appreciates and recognizes the importance of this special session and honoring those who, who so graciously have served as lawyers and judges in, the, in service to the public and the protections of the rights of others. The 22 we remember today served in a variety of legal practices and in the highest state judicial positions. All, however, fought for those who could not fight for themselves, worked to enforce the rule of law, and are most worthy of our gratitude, praise, and respect. Never greater than in this past year have we been reminded of the importance of the rule of law. The rule of law is a principle under which all persons, institutions, and entities are accountable to the laws that are publicly promulgated, equally enforced, independently adjudicated, and consistent with the principles of human rights. Lawyers and judges play an integral role in maintaining the rule of law and are frankly its gatekeepers, especially when they hear the voices and grievances raised by those who have been marginally, who have been marginalized. Those we honor today and remember fought the good fight on behalf of their clients and for their rights. However, we are forever mindful that there is much to do in this never ending pursuit of equal justice under the law. That we in honor of the legacy of those that we remember today must be true to this ideal. Angela Scott, who currently serves as the chair of the American Bar Association section of civil rights and social justice, recently wrote in an article honoring Justice Ginsburg. And she stated that equality is one of the intended principles upon which our democracy was founded. And yet today, we are still working to realize that ideal. The quest for freedom and equality is simultaneously our greatest aspiration, long-standing vulnerability, and some might even say our most significant failure. She went on to say that many Americans recently were awakened to the fact that our systemic structures enable long-standing, although evolved, injustices to prevail. Awareness is not enough. It is time to acknowledge it, intervene, strategically plan to eliminate it and work nonstop until equality is achieved. Those were her words. Referring to the ideas underlying the founding of our nation, Justice Thurgood Marshall wrote that the crucial task is not so much to define our rights and liberties, but to establish institutions which can make the principles embodied in our constitution meaningful in the lives of ordinary citizens. This is our charge, and the men and women we remember today would expect no less of us. We honor those we have lost, support those who have suffered the loss, and share our memories so that we do not forget. And to the families and friends and colleagues of those we remember today, I say we are sorry for your loss and we wish you peace. And may them memorial bring you some comfort. Thank you. And now I would like to welcome Susan Buckley, president of the Ramsey County Bar Association. Thank you, Chief Judge Castro. 
May it please the court, honorable judges, fellow members of the bar, family and friends, on behalf of the Ramsey County Bar Association Board of Directors, thank you for joining us for the 2021 Bar Memorial. We are here today to honor the lives and careers of our colleagues who have gone before us. While we share in the loss of our beloved family, friends, colleagues, and jurists, this memorial celebrates their lives and achievements, the legacy of the contributions they made to clients, to our community, and to their families. Most importantly, these memorials give us an opportunity to think about how these beloved colleagues and family members modeled what the preamble of the Minnesota Rules of Professional Conduct directs. A lawyer should strive to attain the highest level of skill to improve the law and the legal profession and to exemplify the legal profession's ideals of public service. With that, I would like to thank the co-chairs of the 2021 Ramsey County Bar Association Memorials Committee who worked so thoughtfully to make this event a success, Elizabeth Keyes and Scott Borchard, and thanks to their committee members. Thank you to the Bar Association staff and thank you everyone for attending. I now invite Chief Justice Gilday to present the first memorial. May it please the court, I'm Lori Gilday, and I'm honored to give the memorial for Chief Justice Russell Anderson. The Minnesota justice system lost one of our champions with the passing of Russ Anderson. Russ served in the justice system his entire career as an attorney, judge, justice, and chief justice, and the system is all the better for it. Russ's journey began in Bemidji, and he spoke often about his growing up years the life lessons and work ethic he got from his father and mother and his extended family. Russ was a newspaper boy, hired hand on his uncle's farm and a gas station attendant at his dad's gas station. He went on to St. Olaf College where he majored in history and economics and was student body president. Most importantly, he met the love of his life, Kristen at St. Olaf and their union on earth lasted more than 53 years. Russ was a devoted husband and proud father and grandfather. After St. Olaf, it was on to law school at the U of M. Then Russ served his country in the U.S. Navy Judge Advocate General Corps, including working as a JAG officer in Japan, which Russ termed the adventure of my life. Later, his JAG service took Russ to Washington, D.C., where he see, received a master's degree in international law. But then in 1976, Russ came home to Bemidji and entered private practice until he became the Beltrami County attorney, a position he held until his appointment to the district court bench. During his 16 years of service on the district court in the 9th Judicial District, Russ developed a reputation as a fair and compassionate judge. He was a leader in the 9th District, serving as chief judge and on the statewide conference of chief judges. In 1998, Governor Carlson appointed Russ to the Supreme Court. And then in 2006, Governor Aplenty appointed Russ to be Minnesota's Chief Justice, the position he held until his retirement in June of 2008. During his time on the Supreme Court, Russ authored 176 opinions on a vast array of topics. He fought fiercely for the independence of the judiciary cautioning that we must not let the heavy hand of politics come to rest on the scales of justice. From newspaper boy in Bemidji to the Chief Justice of Minnesota, what a remarkable journey. Throughout his career, Russ garnered the respect of all he encountered. His work ethic was legendary and his storytelling hilarious. Russ Anderson lived a life of humility and he was for certain the least self-important, really important person any of us has ever known. It was never about Russ Anderson. It was always and only about the people involved in the cases he was called to decide, as he would say, one human circumstance at a time. As Governor Pawlenty said about Russ in his letter accepting Russ's retirement, you exemplify the very best in public servants. Thank you, Russ. 
we are eternally in your debt. Respectfully submitted, Chief Justice Lori Gilday. May it please the court. I am Kevin Hoffman, and I am here today to honor Peter Berge. Peter Holmes Berge, age 63, of St. Paul, passed away on February 25, 2020, at home, ending a three-year battle with brain cancer. After a San Diego upbringing, St. Olaf College education, and a law degree from William Mitchell College of Law, he was a judicial clerk at the Minnesota Supreme Court and the Minnesota Court of Appeals. He began his private practice in 1985 with Schwabel, Getz, and Sieben, and also practiced with Tewksbury, Kerfeld, and Zimmer, Pritzker and Associates, and Altera Law Group. In 1992, he received a teaching degree or an LLM from Temple University where he studied and taught. He taught at Georgetown University and also at William Mitchell. During his private practice, Peter primarily represented injured plaintiffs, including in the trial court, the Court of Appeals. He co-authored the Practitioner's Guide to the Minnesota No Fault Act. Peter was active in the Minnesota State Bar Association, the Hennepin County Bar Association, and the Ramsey County Bar Association. He also was active in the Association for Continuing Legal Education, ACLEA, and was the president-elect of that organization before his illness led to him stepping down. During all of this, Peter also uh, obtained an MBA degree at the University of Minnesota. People knew Peter for his intelligence, humor, hard work, and hospitality. His skills and knowledge cut a wide swath from consulting, writing, and analysis, to computer and political savvy, to delicious cooking and grilling. Music was a passion for Peter as a listener, concert goer, and performer, particularly the guitar, of which he owned many and on which he played expertly, both solo and with others. He took joy in his dogs, sports, in particular running, soccer, and biking, travel, photography, art, architecture, fine food and wine, friends, family, and his beloved wife, Debbie Sit, who passed in 2015. Peter is survived by his brother, Mark, his brother, Eric, his sister-in-law, Tammy, his nieces and nephews, Kevin, Laura, and Catherine, his extended family, and a host of friends. Despite his aggressive form of cancer, he lived almost twice as long as his initial prognosis, a testimony to his strength, excellent medical care, and a significant circle of caring friends around him. Admired and treasured, Peter was, as his caring bridge comments described him, a positive light in so many people's lives, such an inspiration, a wonderful person and well-respected beloved by many, a truly amazing, brilliant, and talented man, and one of the real good guys in our industry. Respectfully submitted. May it please the court. My name is Michael Cerici, and I am honored to give this memorial on behalf of my brother, Jerry Cerici. My brother was a man of value. He had a good heart and a wonderful brain to go with it. Jerry was a man who lived life for his family and others. Brother was going to school at night after working full time during the day, having the courage to start his own practice or committing his hard earned money to educating his boys at St. Thomas Academy in Marquette. Jerry gave freely of his time, talent and treasure to provide a good life for his family. He spent countless hours watching his kids' games, practices, and other events. The vacations were not extravagant, but filled to the brim with practicality and fun. Most popular was taking the van with the boat towed behind to go fishing and camping in Northern Minnesota and Canada. 
The memories made provided a lifetime of stories and laughs for the entire family. Jerry loved the concept of the law and helping others. He saw being a lawyer as the perfect balance between the duty to provide for his family and the Christian duty to provide for fellow human beings. As a family man, he of course focused primarily on family law, divorces, wills, personal injuries. Nobody would sign up for any of those thinking it is easy, but taking the easy course wasn't how he was raised or more importantly, how he was wired. His energy to help struggling couples extract themselves from a negative situation in a graceful manner was truly a talent. He was never vindictive, callous, or judgmental. Every person who came through his door was not just a client, but a fellow human being who was entitled to be treated with dignity and is so often lost in this world. He spent the time and emotional energy to understand each perspective of a case and sought out solutions, not wins. This approach earned him the reputation as truly down to earth and trustworthy. Other lawyers, as well as judges, arbitrators, and former clients became his friends, not because he tried, but because the person underneath it all was appealing to anyone who met him. Jerry became golfing buddies, lunch partners, Bible study members, and more with many of the colleagues that he met who hit the four decades that he practiced law. 2020 was a difficult year for everyone, but it was especially a difficult year for the Cerisi family as it lost a dad, a brother, an uncle, and their mentor. Exactly as if he would have scripted it himself, he left this world surrounded by his three children, listening to their stories being told about past times, hearing the love in their voices, his spirit and commitment to helping others live a better life lives on because we are all survivors. We will miss you tremendously, Jerry, but your spirit will always be with us. Thank you, my dear brother, for all you did for all of us. Respectfully submitted. May it please the court. My name is Laura Cochran. I'm a member of the bar and the wife of Charles Chuck Cochran, who passed away in December as a result of bile duct cancer. Chuck was born and raised in Superior, Wisconsin. After graduation, he attended law school at the University of Illinois Champaign-Urbana. He passed the bar and was admitted to practice in 1982 in Minnesota, with Wisconsin and the U.S. Federal District Court to follow. After a few years, he opened a solo practice in 1995, where he focused solely on representing injured people in workers' compensation matters. But this doesn't really describe Chuck. So let me explain what it's been like to close his law office. I start with the wall hangings. There's a large photograph of the city of St. Paul. It represents his gratitude to the Manser O'Leary and Gabriel law firm, where he started as a work comp attorney. There's a Hmong tapestry. It's displayed that he displayed proudly as an expression of just some of the diversity of his client base. I find photos of his favorite haunts, the State Fair, the Winter Carnival Ice Palace, hiking trails, and of course, his Green Bay Packer stock certificate. There are cartoon drawings of attorneys, but I also find plaques of favorable, favorable decisions he obtained on behalf of clients from the Minnesota Supreme Court and the Minnesota Work Comp Court of Appeals. Chuck loved people. Whether you were a judge, a grocery store clerk, a plumber, or a fellow attorney, he could talk with anyone. But lest you think he wasn't listening, I can personally attest that he knew your name, your children's name, your hobbies, and as much of your story as you were willing to share. As I move to clean out the desk, I find folders of the number of committees that he has served on with the bar over the years, as well as his legal pro bono work as a volunteer attorney, a mock trial judge, a law student mentor, and a volunteer mediator. And that is not all. There was work files on community involvement and fundraising for Second Harvest Heartland, Simpson Housing, Row Cleanup with the High School, Pancake Breakfast with the Church, and of course, Coach and Equipment Manager for Roseville Youth Basketball. Chuck was a voracious reader, but before I can move books from the shelf, I must remove toy dinosaurs and bobbleheads. He always had them available in case a client needed to bring a child to a consult. I discovered medical texts on anatomy and physiology because Chuck was adamant about understanding the medical records and being prepared for trial. There are books on the working poor, psychology, and chronic pain because he was determined to better understand his clients. 
So how do I sum up the life of Chuck Cochran? A fierce advocate who believed in being prepared for trial, deposition, and hearing. An ethical person who lived his values. A warm, funny, social person who enjoyed music and hiking and sports and the theater. Chuck survived by me his, and his, our son, Michael Cochran his legal assistant, Beth Tetzloff, four siblings, and a number of in-laws and friends that were grateful to know him. Respectfully submitted. May it please the court. I'm Roger Jensen. Um, I am honored to deliver a eulogy on behalf of Willard Converse, my former boss, mentor, partner, and most importantly, my good friend. Willard was a third generation Minnesota lawyer. His grandfather, also named Willard, uh, came up from Iowa with lawyer friend Vance Granis to South St. Paul where they set up their law practice. He was appointed to the Dakota County District Court bench in 1914 where he sat for many years. Willard's father, Richard, practiced with the Robbins Davis and Lyons firm uh, where Willard also practiced. Daughters Pam, and son Mitch became fourth generation lawyers in the same family, a distinction that very few families can, can, can claim. He grew up in the White Bear Lake area. In high school, he was known as Speed Converse for his running prowess on the football field. It was there that he met his wife, Shirley. Before college, he served in the Navy at the end of World War II in the Pacific Theater as a signalman aboard the USS Girard. He described his experiences when the war ended with Japan's surrender, being one of the first naval crews granted shore leave in Japan, and how the Japanese people, as instructed by the emperor, treated them with respect and honor. He also laughingly described how one of his fellow crewmen drained the alcohol from the ship's compass, disabling the compass while becoming intoxicated and ending up in the brig. After the service, he enrolled at the University of Minnesota and then its law school. In law school, he was on the law review and graduated magna cum laude. In his years of practice, I believe his greatest skill was as a legal writer and appellate advocate. It's reported that he ghost wrote Sally Robbins briefs while at the Robbins firm, uh, where he became a partner. He proudly displayed his many brief paper books, as he called them in our firm library. In 1949, Willard married his high school sweetheart, Shirley. He and Shirley raised their five children in a large, beautiful old home just south of Lake Phelan in St. Paul. Those children are Pam, Diane, Nancy, Elizabeth, and the caboose, Mitch. Their children have produced 14 grandchildren and two great-grandchildren. Sadly, they lost their first grandchild, Max Anderson, a few years ago. Shirley and Willard had 71 wonderful years of marriage. In the mid-1960s, Willard, along with Robin's partners, Erwin Peterson and Bob Bell, formed the St. Paul firm, Peterson Bell & Converse. The firm had a unique collection of clients, including insurance companies, labor organizations, and the cities of Roseville, Badness Heights, and White Bear Lake. At its peak, the firm grew to 14 lawyers with offices in downtown St. Paul and Roseville, and for a time in Minneapolis. Willard's interests were wide and varied. Uh, what we now call progressive politics, a good joke well told, bird hunting with his lab bear, fishing with Mitch and grandkids at their summer home, uh, on East Twin Lakes near Nishwa, and bridge with his country club pals. He played handball at the old St. Paul Athletic Club several times a week with his friend, Jerry Finn. He was a longtime member of Southview Country Club. Willard didn't hit the ball very far as he grew older, but he continued to have a wonderful short game, which won him many Nassau bets, usually partnered with his old friend, Bob Munson. At home, he daily read three newspapers and in the evening had his favorite, a dry beef eater martini on the rocks with two olives and a twist. Willard Converse taught me and every one of the lawyers of our firm 
how to practice law well and honorably, and how to be a good parent, spouse, and friend. We miss him dearly. Willard died at age 94, August 7, 2020. Respectfully submitted, Roger Jensen. May it please the court, good afternoon. My name is Joanne Smith, and I'm honored and privileged to present the memorial today for Michael Fisk Driscoll. Michael was the second son born to Sarah, also known as Sally, and Albert, also known as Al Driscoll of St. Paul. Michael is predeceased by his parents and his older brother, Andy. He is survived by his siblings, Susan, Sarah, and Kevin. Michael was born in 1942 in St. Paul, Minnesota, and maintained an ardent love of St. Paul throughout his entire life. He attended St. Luke's grade school and later graduated from St. Paul Academy. He attended college at both UCLA as his family lived in California for a brief period of time. Upon moving back to Minnesota, Michael attended the University of Minnesota, graduating with a degree in political science. Following his graduation, Michael joined the United States Peace Corps and spent two years in Ethiopia. After Michael finished serving those years in the Peace Corps, he traveled extensively. He traveled to Beirut, Istanbul, Athens, Rome, Florence, and Venice. He then furthered his travels to Switzerland, Austria, Germany, Denmark, and finally England. When he returned home, Michael was 25 years old and he was drafted into the United States Army as this was during the Vietnam era. He was a conscientious, conscientious objector and refused to carry a gun. He was then trained as an Army medic and sent to Vietnam. Fortunately, Michael was not sent to the front lines and he was honorably discharged from the Army after serving nine months in Vietnam. In 1976, with the encouragement of Supreme Court Justice Rosalie Wall, Michael attended William Mitchell College of Law. He was employed by the Honorable William J. Fleming as a law clerk for four years while attending law school. Shortly after graduating from law school, he worked in the Senate Council's office in the Minnesota Legislature. Michael was then hired by the St. Paul City Attorney's Office. Michael worked for a time as a chief prosecutor for the city and finally ended his legal career as attorney for the public housing agency for the city and held this position for 25 years. In 1975, and while working at the Ramsey County Workhouse, Michael met his beloved wife, Leah. They married in 1983, and their daughter Jessica was born in 1984. Michael was a devoted and wonderful husband, partner, and an amazing father. When Michael spoke of Leah and Jessica, that characteristic twinkle in his eye even shone brighter. Michael was so proud to be Jessica's father and Leah's husband. Michael was a lover of jazz, and he and Leah enjoyed many evenings at the Dakota and introduced Jessica to music and dance at a young age. They shared a deep love of the theater, especially musicals, and had season tickets to the Guthrie and frequented the Hennepin Theater Trust in the Ordway. Michael was also a great mentor to younger lawyers and to many of his nieces and nephews and others in his family. Michael's colleagues have great memories of a straightforward approach to the law and to his life. He was a tremendous champion for the underdogs in our society, and he fiercely believed and advocated for equal rights, human rights, and was a strong supporter of women. Michael enjoyed engaging in passionate debates about social justice, politics, law, and just about any other topic. I'm sure those who knew Michael can hearken back to so many of those debates and conversations that were sometimes challenging, but also respectful and enriching. Later in life, Michael was well known for posting his many opinions on Facebook. He just could not let injustice pass without comment. 
He thought it was part of his civic duty to be a voice for those who could not successfully advocate for themselves without the support of others who are in better positions to make change and support their fellow human beings. Throughout his life, Michael financially supported and served on several nonprofit boards that fought to eliminate violence against women and children. He was a charter member of the boards of Women's Advocates and the St. Paul Intervention Project. He also supported the arts and other organization that work towards equality for all. When reflecting on his life, Michael would often comment that he was so fortunate and appreciative of all he had experienced. His family continues to live in that same mindset of gratitude in his memory and lovingly remember their husband, father, brother, brother-in-law, sister-in-law, uncle, and the man who gave the best hugs. Rest in peace, my dear friend. You enriched all the lives you touched and are greatly missed. Respectfully submitted, Joanne Smith. May it please the court. My name is Dave Oren, and it's my privilege to present this memorial honoring my friend and colleague, Arden Fritz. Arden and I worked together at the Minnesota Department of Health in our legal unit. This was from May of 2010 until his passing. He was a truly remarkable person and lawyer. Arden lost a courageous battle to cancer in January of 2020. He survived by his wife and best friend, Judy, along with many family and friends. Arden was raised in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin. As a young man, Arden served for six years in the U.S. Coast Guard and Reserves. He then went on to be an exceptional student at the University of Texas at Arlington and at Hamlin University School of Law. Arden's legal career began as a public defender, where it was said his knowledge of the law was excellent and he passionately represented his clients. After the public defender office, Arden then became an assistant county attorney in Sherman County, working in the criminal division and then in the civil division. One of Arden's fellow assistant county attorneys at the time was Todd Shuffleman, now Judge Todd Shuffleman from the 10th Judicial District in Anoka. A memorable time working with Arden was on the Franken-Coleman election recount after the 2008 U.S. Senate election. It was several very tense days dealing with partisans for Franken and Coleman. It included long hours and late nights. Arden's calm and competent demeanor was essential in keeping the tension to a minimum. Judge Huffelman said how much he appreciated that Arden took the late nights so he could be home in the evenings with his young kids. With Arden's legal skills and personal qualities, Judge Huffelman couldn't think of anyone he'd rather have at his side than Arden as they worked through the challenging issues. When Arden first started at the Minnesota Department of Health, he advised in the areas of contracts and emergency preparedness. He expanded into reviewing background studies, and he also handled most of the one-off legal issues that came to the door. His versatility was greatly appreciated. The culmination of Arden's career came in 2019 when he was appointed as the department's chief legal counsel. Unfortunately, this was cut short by his health problems. One of my most indelible memories of working with Arden involved the Minnesota Attorney General's lawsuit against 3M. The lawsuit was over perfluorochemicals in the environment in the East Metro. While the department was not a party to the lawsuit, we did have a lot of scientific expertise and private health data related to the crux of the lawsuit. And our scientific experts and private health data did not align up in a way that made either side completely happy. And so the department was caught in the middle. In the end, our best way to protect public health was to ensure our scientists were protected in speaking the truth as they saw it. Arden was instrumental in preventing private health data and the department's good reputation from being misused in a tug of war between BMS fighting over billions of dollars. In closing, Arden was God's faithful servant dedicated to his profession and the people in his life. He held traditional values, was a man of great integrity and a powerful communicator. He was enthusiastic, optimistic, intelligent, kind, loyal, patient, empathetic, and had a wicked sense of humor. He was held in high regard by all who knew him and loved dearly by many. Respectfully submitted by Dave Oren, Judy Fritz, and Todd Shuffleman. May it please the court. My name is Robert E. McGarry, Jr. I'm here to uh, read the memorial for retired 
workers' compensation judge and Ramsey County attorney, Daniel Gallagher. But Dan was a very close friend of our families, and especially my father, who was also a Ramsey County uh, attorney, Robert E. McGarry Jr. Daniel Barry Gallagher was born on February 23rd, 1929. Raised in Waseca, Minnesota, Dan was younger brother to Kathleen and Patricia, an older brother to Michael. Dan's father, Frank T. Gallagher, served on the Minnesota Supreme Court as an Associate Justice from 1947 to 1963. And Dan's uncle, Henry M. Gallagher, served as Chief Justice from 1937 to 1944 the only siblings to have served on the Minnesota Supreme Court. Dan's brother and dearest friend, Mike, was also a lawyer with a long career specializing in local government law for the Attorney General's Office of the State of Minnesota. Mike died in 2017. Dan graduated from Sacred Heart High School in Waseca. He started college, but entered the service midway through, serving as a supply officer during the Korean War. He completed his undergraduate degree at the University of Minnesota and went on to work as an insurance adjuster while attending law school at William Mitchell College of Law, which he fondly referred to as Billy Mitchell. His father officiated when Dan was admitted to the bar in 1957. He began his law career in private practice in Waseca, later moving to the Twin Cities and ultimately serving as a workers' compensation judge for the state of Minnesota. Dan was a devoted family man. He and his wife, Grace, celebrated 52 years of marriage and raised two daughters, Mary and Anne, in Shoreview. He was later a doting grandpa to grandchildren, Soren and Solveig. As a judge, Dan brought careful and thoughtful analysis to his decisions, often working into the night and on weekends. He cared deeply about being fair, informed, and thorough. After a long and fulfilling career, Dan retired in 1992 and went on to enjoy a long and fulfilling retirement. Although his memory and physical strength declined in the last years of his life, his personality remained intact. While claiming he needed a new writer, Dan managed to land a comedy zingers until the very end. His kids kept a running collection of his one-liners and now enjoy quoting him with the likes of, I'm frightened of life, and I'd like to do some tasteful heavy drinking, and I don't care what your mother says, I still like you. Dan was a sentimental, principled, compassionate, and kind person. In the final years of his life living at Cherrywood Point Assisted Living Facility, he greeted anyone who entered his room as friend. He died on August 31st, 2020, of complications to Alzheimer's disease. His final words were, I love you. His family extends gratitude to the Ramsey County Bar Association for recognizing his life and career, along with so many others who died in 2020. Re respectfully submitted by Robert E. McGarry Jr. and Dan's family, his wife Grace and daughters Mary and Anne. May it please the court. Lori Hartenberger was a true friend with immense talent and a heart of gold. Lori had a steadfast commitment to family and service to others. Lori began her career as a graphics artist. Called to the law, she returned to law to school at the age of 37, earning her BA and paralegal certificate from Hamlin University. Buoyed by her studies and the support of Hamlin's faculty, she attended and graduated from Hamlin University School of Law and was admitted to the Minnesota Bar. Lori used her legal skills and her passion to serve others as a guardian ad litem and child advocate. She represented children in foster care and she practiced family law. When her health limited her ability to practice, she used her skills to assist other lawyers in serving their clients. Lori freely shared her time and design skills and her legal skills to help others. Volunteer with Volunteer Lawyers Network, Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, the MSBA Life and Law Committee, and other organizations. Lori fused her design, writing, and advocacy skills, her experience with depression, and her desire to help others with action. Early in her career, she facilitated an art therapy group and, and 
developed a brochure for that program. Later, newly armed with her law degree, she presented a CLE program on mental and hem chemical health for new lawyers. She brought valuable perspective as a new lawyer to a brochure she developed for the Life and Law Committee called Are You Fit to Practice? Advising prospective law students on character and fitness and encouraging them to seek help early. Her brochure has been shared and adapted nationwide. Lori also helped create LCL's brochure, which carries much of her design today. She was quick to volunteer to share her own story in one of LCL's first stories brochure as an example of someone who had been helped by LCL. These brochures were mailed to lawyers throughout the state and her courage no doubt inspired others to ask for help. She also contributed to a William Mitchell College of Law article on disbarment of, disbarment of impaired lawyers. Firmly planted in Minnesota, Lori's heart remained with her family in Wisconsin. As her health deteriorated, she found joy in keeping up with her nephews and their families. She supported her mother as her mother's health failed and brought joy to family and friends by painting pictures for them. Through illness and pandemic, she even made new friends who are more like family. She is greatly missed by all of us. Respectfully submitted. May it please the court, Judge Doris Olson Huspini, age 91 of Lindstrom, formerly of Minneapolis, died peacefully at home on September 11th, 2020, surrounded by her beloved and loving family, a member of the greatest generation, a child of the Great Depression, a loyal wife of over 64 years, the Navy veteran Joseph, Doris blazed the trail for women attorneys, graduated as a sole female near the top of her 1970 William Mitchell Law School class. Her career spanned a remarkable 44 years, commencing as she served from 1970 to 1973 as an assistant state public defender. She then inspired young minds from 1973 to 1974 at the University of Minnesota, where she law professor. Her profound compassion and insight were called upon as she served as the Edmund County Family Court referee from 1974 to 1980. She often remarked how challenging it was to weigh all the consideration and dissolution to marriage, particularly those involved by her children. She prioritized the importance of safeguarding the best interests of children amidst the often acrimonious atmosphere of parental backgrounds. Her next edition appointment brought the scope of legal issues brought before her. As she served as a head of the county municipal court judge from 1980 to 1982, then a head of the county district court judge from 1982 to 1984, she enjoyed a variety of litigation each new day brought. In 1984, another call came for her to become one of the founding 12 members of the newly created Minnesota State Court of Appeals. <laughs> Although she missed the face-to-face -face courtroom interaction with her against my legal counsel, this appointment allowed her to travel routinely throughout the state and collaborate with numerous colleagues and three judge panels. Following mandatory retirement in late 1988, Doris immediately returned to the Court of Appeals as a retired judge, serving in that capacity until late 2014. Doris further reached the legal community throughout her numerous years of serving on the law school faculty of William Mitchell and Hamlin Law Schools. Doris excelled as a mentor both professionally and in her personal life. She enjoyed singing, bottom dancing, bridge gardening, and above all other talents, being the wise and patient counselor and role model for her family. The rest leaves behind a considerable legacy in the thousands of lives she touched, being through professional contact, personal relationships, 
that teach them what pick and she offer a truly incredible life, one example of generosity, conscientiousness, and kindness she embodied. She had to place this gift of installing strong values in her children and grandchildren. By living these values each day of her life, she would make gracious and grateful throughout her life. She's greatly missed in all her role, most especially in that of a devoted, loving mother and grandmother. To the woman who spent decades of her life hearing the words, Your Honor, directed toward her, we humbly submit that on the contrary, indeed it was entirely our, our honor to have known her. I respectfully submitted. May it please the court. I'm Rick Snyder. I had the honor of serving as Chief Justice Sandy Keith's first law clerk at the Minnesota Supreme Court. Sandy Keith led a remarkable life of public service in both the government and private sectors. He served in all three branches of Minnesota government as a state senator, Minnesota lieutenant governor, and chief justice of the Minnesota Supreme Court. Born in Rochester in 1928, he excelled as a student and three sport athlete. He attended Amherst College where he played football and wrestled for four years, graduating with honors. He earned his law degree from Yale Law School. Intent on serving his country, he enlisted after law school in the Marine Corps during the Korean War, serving as a first lieutenant. Following his military service, he married Marion Sanford and returned to Rochester, where the couple raised two sons, Ian and Douglas. He worked in the legal department of the Mayo Clinic alongside future Supreme Court Justice Harry Blackman. While in Rochester, Sandy Keith began a fascinating political career. He was viewed as uh, by many as Minnesota's version of JFK, young, fair-haired and handsome, a veteran with an Ivy League education and one of the most engaging and dynamic politicians Minnesota had ever seen. He was elected to the Minnesota Senate and later was elected Lieutenant Governor. Many in his party viewed Sandy Keith as the heir apparent to the governorship. He won the party's nomination for governor at the 1966 state convention. However, in one of his only political setbacks, he lost the nomination in the primary election. He then joined forces with one of his former Senate opponents to form the Rochester law firm known today as Dunlap Seeger. Focusing on family law, Sandy Keith was ahead of his time as an outspoken promoter of alternative dispute resolution to resolve thorny family law disputes. He was an adept mediator, gaining trust and bringing people together to put acrimony aside and focus on constructive resolutions. In 1989, he was appointed to the Minnesota Supreme Court and was soon elevated to Chief Justice. During his tenure, he promoted greater diversity on the bench and led many court improvement initiatives. He spearheaded the court's community outreach and engagement efforts, including creating the court's traveling oral argument program. After his judicial career ended, he refocused efforts to serve his hometown community of Rochester. He helped form the Rochester Downtown Alliance and served as its executive director, working to revitalize downtown Rochester and advocating to bring a branch of the University of Minnesota to Rochester. Sandy Keith was a leader and a tremendous mentor. He is remembered for the genuine interest he showed in the lives of everyone he met. One of his keys to his success was the way in which he connected with everyone he encountered from all walks of life. Over his memorable life and career, Sandy Keith brought determination, passion, and a buoyant spirit to his efforts to improve the lives of his clients and colleagues, his neighbors in Rochester, and the people of Minnesota. Respectfully submitted, Rick Snyder. May it please the court. My name is Sally Scoggin, and I'm honored to present this for Jack Kennefeck. Jack grew up in St. Paul, eventually becoming a lawyer, a counselor, a farmer, and the keeper of stories of his large Irish Welsh family. When people called Jack, they knew they were calling a man of integrity, ability, and compassion. Jack graduated from St. Thomas College and in 1965 from the University of Minnesota Law School. That summer, he and Julie married and began a partnership that would continue for 55 years. Jack had planned to begin business school at Wharton in the fall of 1965, but the government had other plans. He wound up spending over three years in the Marines at the Quantico 
base for the JAG Corps. The Kennevex returned to St. Paul in 1969, where Jack worked first for the Minnesota Attorney General's Office and then starting in 1972 at Briggs & Morgan, now Taft. Jack and Julie happily raised three daughters, Bridget, Kiki, and Nicole, and have seven grandchildren. Much of Jack's 40-plus year of practice at Briggs focused on healthcare, where he represented medical professionals, hospitals, and other healthcare entities. He had a remarkable grasp of complex healthcare regulations. He had a wonderful ability to help his clients navigate complicated medical issues, including the many situations where the law was not well settled. He was involved in several important cases, including an early Minnesota Supreme Court case that dealt with difficult issues regarding withdrawal of life support and the court's role in those decisions. Jack also used his skills in pro bono and community work. He was a long-term and valued member of the Biomedical Ethics Committee of the Children's Hospitals and Clinics. To colleagues, clients, friends, and family, Jack always stood ready to help and did so in a thoughtful, careful, and respectful way. As one former colleague said, did you ever hear him curse or utter a harsh word about anyone? How many guys have great husband, dad, lawyer, U.S. Marine, farmer, and perfect friend after their name? In 1994, lawyer Jack, Jack became lawyer farmer Jack when he and Julie moved to a farm outside River Falls. There, they became active in the movement to protect and raise endangered Navajo churro sheep. Their farm eventually included a goat, a llama, dogs, and Jack's beloved horse, Cody. Jack was an accomplished rider, perhaps a skill inherited from one of his great grandfathers who'd operated a livery stable. In the River Falls area, Jack continued his pro bono work, including with the Knickknack River Land Trust, Spring Valley Seniors, Staying Put, the Friends of the Old Martell Schoolhouse, and the Navajo Churro Sheep Association. He also served on the Martell Township Planning Board. He and Julie were instrumental in preserving the historic Martell School Building. Jack's colleagues, friends, family, and so many in the community are grateful for Jack's service and for his unfailing decency and kindness. Respectfully submitted, Sally Scoggin. May it please the court. Craig Lindicky was born on June 13, 1946 in St. Paul, Minnesota. A loving husband, father, and grandfather, he passed away from heart failure on August 5, 2020 in St. Paul at the age of 74. He explored the world and pursued his far-reaching interests with curiosity and a gregarious personality. Craig spent his childhood in Minnesota, Kentucky, North Carolina, and Germany. This early exposure to a variety of cultures and lifestyles inspired a lifelong love of travel. After graduating from Wayland Academy in Beaver Dam, Wisconsin, Craig attended Williams College in the Berkshire Mountains of Western Massachusetts. His college studies were interrupted by four years of army service during the Vietnam War. After his tour of duty, he was shipped directly back to Williams with only his uniforms for clothing. He was known as Sarge by his college friends ever after. After graduating from Williams, Craig pursued a law degree at Vanderbilt University in Nashville and joined Spear and Hill in New York City when he graduated. He enjoyed telling of his adventures on Wall Street, especially his role in the firm's representation of the Sultan of Oman. When the firm dissolved, Craig returned to St. Paul and began working in the Minnesota Office of the Reviser of Statutes. Accomplished and outgoing, Craig was well known at the Capitol. He formed close connections with the many legislators and staff with whom he worked drafting and reviewing legislation and rules. Craig's easy way of communicating, listening skills, and command of language helped him excel in his role of translating ideas into law. He particularly enjoyed serving as the legislative attorney for the Ways and Means Committee. Craig also enjoyed mentoring newer attorneys and connecting personally with all of the support staff in the office until his retirement in 2011. Craig was dedicated to community service and the betterment of others. Through the years, he sponsored refugees resettling in Minnesota, served on the boards of Neighborhood House and the Lexham Community Council, and delivered countless wheels, meals with Meals on Wheels. While mindful of his need to remain politically neutral during his career as a bipartisan public servant, he proudly displayed the United Nations flag as a symbol of world peace. Craig connected easily with people who crossed his path, especially his neighbors and their dogs, for whom he always had a spare treat. Generous with his time, Craig hosted dozens of international students and staff from France and Japan at his home. He loved taking his family and visitors on road trips, visiting baseball stadiums, national parks, historical sites, and friends and family across the country. 
He also loved international travel. And Craig was an avid collector of everything from books, records, stamps, presidential campaign buttons, and car brochures to the Star Wars figurines displayed prominently in his office. Craig will be remembered by his colleagues and friends for his legal acumen, his charisma, sense of humor, and kindness. He is survived by his wife, Elizabeth, children, Ben, Bill, Anne, Glenn, and Lisa, and their families, and he is greatly missed. Respectfully submitted by Benjamin Thompson, Ginny Ann Glasgow, Emily Parks, and Seth Daniels. May it please the court. I present to the Ramsey County Bar Association this remembrance of my dear friend, Bridget McDonough. I'm honored to do this today because Bridget was a good friend. She was such a good friend that she agreed to be my treasurer on the U.S. Senate campaign. And by the way, if you follow campaigning these years, if you followed what can happen in politics, that's kind of a courageous thing to do. But it was part of her tradition in that she wanted to serve and she wanted to help people who were friends, people she knew, or maybe even people she didn't know. She loved her family. She loved Reed, how hard that was at the end. But I remember talking to her back then and they had those few last years together that were so precious. And I know she also loved her extended family. I remember being in the Stillwater Parade. It was lumberjack days back then. And she, they were always sitting in the same corner and she would run over and her sister would run over. And they'd make sure I hugged everybody. Bridget's life and career were rooted in how she could best lift others up. As the daughter of a judge, she developed an understanding early on of how government and the law can be used to help people help people achieve equity and social justice in a world where playing fields are not often level. She recognized the power of political and community mobilization, of getting involved. She was inspired by the DFL tradition. And when I think of Bridget and what politician she most loved, even though I will, she was my treasurer, I think for 20 years, it was Senator Paul Wellstone. That's how I first met her. I first met her, she was a true believer in Paul's work. And here she was at the time, a lawyer working uh, at a business law firm, doing her work, loving her work, loved by the people she worked with. But she was the one uh, that was out there supporting Paul uh, with those green signs. She committed herself to service to others. She was also, as you all know, a skilled lawyer with a brilliant legal mind, and much of her work actually focused on providing affordable housing to underserved communities, and she brought an incredible amount of expertise to this goal. Whether she was representing immigrant and refugee families who are pro bono work, supporting her alma mater and community by serving on the McAllister College Board and the Hmong Partnership Board, or chairing the St. Paul DFL, now that, that alone is a career. Bridget always brought this earnest conviction to fight for what was good and just, often on behalf of people who couldn't always do that for themselves. She was kind and generous, loyal to friends and colleagues, and compassionate, smart, and funny. I always admired her adventurous spirit and her ability to capture your attention with her opinions on everything, from Minnesota politics to Bruce Springsteen. She and Reed loved traveling, and they were both voracious readers. I think I'm gonna end with a story. I talked to my daughter today, and you know she's now the ripe old age of 20, five and she this is a story from when she was really really young and she was in our um, the nativity play at our church and she was to play the angel and she was the youngest one in the play she was like three or four years old she's sitting out there in the pews with these big angel wings and she wouldn't go out to practice and i said why won't you go out there she goes i don't want to go out there I said, you gotta go out there. You've got the coolest part. You get to go at the end and spread your wings. And then she looked at me and she looked at the ceiling of the church and she said, mom, I don't know how to tell them. I don't know how to fly. And I looked at her and I said, you know what, honey? Not all angels fly. Bridget McDonough, she gave so many people those wings to fly. Whether it was a US Senator or whether it was someone who just needed a home whether it was someone in the Hmong community that needed a friend or needed a job, whether it was a colleague at work or a sister who needed someone to talk to. Let's remember Bridget's fierce love of life. That's what made her so special. 
We're going to miss her. We miss her so much right now. Respectfully submitted by Senator Amy Klobuchar. Thank you. Good afternoon, Your Honor. May it please the court. My name is Bill Pentelovich. I am with the firm of Maslin LLP in Minneapolis. And I am here today to memorialize the Honorable John C. McNulty. I will be reading a memorial written by John's uh, wife, Marcy Wallace. John and Marcy are longtime dear friends of mine and former partners of mine at Maslin. And this is what Marcy has written. John C. McNulty died at home on December 18th, 2020, six days before his 96th birthday, as a result of injuries suffered in an accident on December 9th. John never looked old nor acted his biological age. John loved the Toby Keith song on Aging Well, Don't Let the Old Man In. And John especially loved the video in which Clint Eastwood, who inspired the song, acts out the lyrics. John was a herald of civility in the legal profession, advocating for more civil relationships between lawyers, particularly in the litigation arena. And as a personal one, I'll say that that is one of the main things I learned from John in the years I worked with him was civility. John engaged in such activities from a number of platforms, including as president of the Hennepin County Bar Association, as president of the American Judicature Society, as chair of the American Bar Association Committee on Professional Discipline, as a fellow of the American Bar Foundation, and for a time as a municipal court judge in St. Louis Park. John practiced law with the same civility for which he was for which he advocated. He was that guy who invited opposing counsel out for a drink while the jury deliberated. Many of John's former colleagues have recalled him as a gentleman and a mentor, and have referred to the and have referred to the dignity and grace with which he always conducted himself. John loved attending bar conventions, though he often skipped the CLEs. He was there to network and socialize with colleagues. He was a longtime member of the VEVJ Day Club, a group of lawyers and judges who meet once a year for dinner featuring prognostications and sometimes risque humor. A graduate of the University of Minnesota Law School, John practiced law in the Twin Cities for more than 40 years in a variety of settings. The most notable was his more than 20 years as a name partner in the firm that was then known as Maslin Kaplan Edelman Borman Brand and McNulty. John was the last surviving of those name partners. John joined Maslin in the late 1950s as the first lawyer in the firm who was not Jewish. As a Catholic, John had suffered from employment discrimination by larger law firms similar to that which had been experienced by the Jewish lawyers who founded the Maslin firm. Outside of the law, John was always active, enjoying many physical activities. Until his mid eighties, he kept a 30 foot sailboat on Lake Superior and organized many trips through the Great Lakes with friends and with family. These often featured challenging storms. He earned a Coast Guard Master Mariner's license and he had a private pilot's license. John was an accomplished downhill and cross country skier who skied the 35, 34 mile Birkebinder court cross country ski race in his 70s. He loved to golf, having managed a 27 hole golf course before and during his law school years. And he kept golfing until he was almost 90. John is survived and sorely missed by his wife of almost 40 years, Marcy Wallace, by his sister, by his four children, by his 10 great grandchildren, and by many nieces and nephews. Rest in peace, John, and well done. You never did let the old man in. Respectfully submitted by Marcy Wallace on behalf of the family, and respectfully submitted by me on their behalf. If it pleases the court, my name is Steve Kirsch and I'm honored to talk about my dear friend, Bob Mernan. Bob died at age 85 on December 11th, 2020 in his home in St. Paul. He was born September 16th, 1935 in St. Paul 
to E.W. Bill and Violet Mernan. Bob and his wife, Margaret Mary, we call her Muggs, were married for 62 years. Bob was survived by his sister, uh, Patricia Colsway. Four children, 13 grandchildren, and four great-grandchildren. Bob was a devoted husband, father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, and his family always came first. He was a devout Catholic, and his strong faith was instilled in his whole family. Bob and I had some great discussions on the Catholic and Jewish religions. I was the first non-Catholic partner in the firm. I threatened Bob with many lawsuits all the time. He would banter back. Bob was well known for his bantering, and I think everybody misses that. Bob's love of spending time with his family at the cabin became legendary. His grandfather first visited the Whitefish chain in the late 1920s, and Bob grew up enjoying the year-round great beauty of Rush Lake and the city of Cross Lake. His great-grandchildren represent the sixth generation of Mernan family members to enjoy the beauty of this area. I asked Bob once if Godfather II was filmed at the Mernan compound, and that running joke continued for decades. Sometime in the early 1990s, my kids and I took a boat ride on Cross Lake with Bob. Bob was in complete control of the throttle. My kids and I went to chiropractors for years after that boat ride. Then there was the time that Larry King and I rode with Bob from the Twin Cities to his Cross Lake cabin for a law firm retreat. Normally this would be a three or four hour drive. It was the scariest two hours of my life. Bob really enjoyed driving fast. Even my wife rode with him one time. He even raced drag cars at the Brainerd track. He would be a semi-regular at the track. I suspect his family would all agree that I am not ex exaggerating on his driving prowess. Bob graduated from Nativity of Our Lord grade school in St. Thomas Academy in 1953. He completed his undergraduate studies at the University of St. Thomas and received his law degree from the University of Minnesota in 1959. Bob enjoyed an impressive 50-year career as a successful and admired trial lawyer in the law firm started by his father, E.W. Mernan, and his uncle, Charles Mernan, in 1940. The Mernan Law Firm was one of the premier law firms in the Twin Cities and the state and was respected for 75 years with a statewide reputation for excellence. Bob played a crucial role in the firm's success and growth. In later years, he mentored new attorneys in the firm, and it was well known that he had a notebook that carried his summary of Minnesota appellate court decisions for decades. One of the lawyers, any lawyer that was in trial at the firm, if they needed a case to support their position to tell the judge, they would call Bob for the answer. It was a great plan B for any firm. Bob was a very busy trial lawyer and probably enjoyed preparing for trials more than actually trying them. He was a proud member in the American Board of Trial Advocates, ABOTA. He also served several decades on the Ramsey County Ethics Committee. Bob knew ethical standards and followed them to the letter. He taught the lawyers in the law firm that there were no shortcuts regarding ethics ever to be taken at the Renan firm. For some lawyers starting out at the firm, I think it would be fair to say that Bob's bark was worse than his bite. Deep down inside, once you got to know him, he was as compassionate and as heartfelt as anyone you would ever meet. He had a razor sharp wit and a very sarcastic sense of humor. He did not suffer fools, and though he enjoyed telling jokes, I think he had more enjoyment criticizing the joke teller. Bob was an avid duck hunter and downhill skier. He pursued those passions for decades and passed those rich traditions down to his children and grandchildren. He was well known for his integrity, intellect, and humility. He was very proud to be a lawyer. He was very proud of his profession. Because Bob was such a family man, he treated the entire law firm 
from bookkeeper to receptionist to associate to partner as a family. His passing is truly an end of an era. He not only had excellent traits to be a trial lawyer, but these excellent traits exemplified what a terrific human being he was. His family and his former law partners and friends will truly miss him. Godspeed, old friend. Respectfully submitted, Steve Kirsch. May it please the court. David O'Connor was born in Buffalo, New York on October 27, 1930. Soon thereafter, his family moved to St. Paul, Minnesota, where he was raised and where he later practiced law. As Dave progressed through his school years, his teachers still learned that he was an exceptional student. In fact, he skipped first and second grade and later graduated from Creighton High School at the young age of 16. From Creighton, he went on to attend two years of college in Minnesota and then went on to four years of Dietary College in Chicago. After graduation, Dave went back to the Twin Cities where he began his podiatry practice in Minneapolis. In 1949, Dave went on a blind date and met the love of his life, Patsy. He was 18 and she was 19. They married in 1954 and Dave immediately entered the army where he served two years during the Korean War. Except for this time in the army, from the first date 72 years ago until his death on August 2, 2000, Dave and Patsy were virtually inseparable. Upon his return from his military duty, Dave and Patsy had seven children. While working as a podiatrist, he spent four years attending William Mitchell College of Law at night, finally earning his law degree in 1960, the year of his 30th birthday. With a wife and seven children to care for, Dave's practice grew and he quickly became a master in the courtroom. With his focus on personal injury, premises liability, and medical malpractice, Dave's photographic memory allowed him to become an expert in many areas of medicine, including traumatic brain injuries, spinal cord injuries, and post-traumatic stress disorder, to name a few. In fact, Dave became so skilled in the courtroom that one of the judges in Washington County said to other attorneys in the courtroom, if you ever want to know how to conduct a perfect trial, watch this guy right here, Dave O'Connor. As he began, began winning trial after trial, he soon gained a reputation in the legal community, and more specifically, the legal defense community, as one of the top five litigators in the Twin Cities. A major Twin Cities law firm was known to advise, advise its attorneys that if Dave O'Connor was on the other side, they'd better settle or they would surely lose. Although Dave was a champion for his clients with countless wins, there were some hard losses as well, but he never lost his fierce passion for the law or his passion as a litigator for his clients. Dave's 46 years of sobriety was helping others recover from alcoholism, serving as a sponsor to many, and running successful interventions for people with addictions. He served on countless boards, including Hazelwood and Twin Town. He was one of the five founders of Lawyers Concerned for Lawyers, an organization that helped lawyers with chemical dependency, mental health issues, depression, and anxiety. As we all know, this organization is still very strong today. Dave lived a life that was full and wonderful with his family, sticking together through joy and tragedy. The death of their 36-year-old son, Michael Francis, in 2000, was particularly hard on Dave and Patsy, and they struggled through that pain side by side. The pain of losing their son is something that never truly healed. After Dave's retirement from the practice of law, he developed an interest in real estate, and he and Patsy headed to Florida. He worked to obtain his real estate license there. Never one to let his grass grow under his feet, he started this new career at the ripe old age of 70 and worked happily for 14 more years in his newly chosen field. Dave lived a life of love. Like he loved his wife Kathy, his seven children, and all of his many grandchildren and great grandchildren. Some of his greatest passions were spent with his family camping, hunting, fishing, and ice skating. He spent many fond weekends with his family, enjoying lake life and teaching his kids how to fish and water ski. 
But it was those days with his buddies up north, hunting and cooking their game and enjoying the camaraderie with the brilliant stars that he truly cherished. Day's intelligence was boundless. For most of us, he was the smartest man we've ever known or will ever know. His photographic memory meant he could take information and there it take in information and there it remained. You could ask him anything and he knew the answer. His vocabulary was endless, his knowledge and love of American history was passionate, and he could answer any question you asked him, no matter how obscure the topic. Most of us remember Dave for his enviable sense of humor and charming sarcasm. We all knew when he hooked his eyebrow or gave us the stare that there was a twinkle behind that look and that he was just being playful. He was a complicated guy and we all miss all aspects of who he was. I've had the pleasure of knowing the O'Connor family for the past 55 years and I'm honored that they asked me to make this um, memorial in Dave's honor. Respectfully submitted by Kathleen O'Connor and Mary Batten. May it please the court. I'm Norm Coleman, former United States Senator from Minnesota, former mayor of St. Paul, and I'm here to honor Alberto Quintella. Alberto was born August 29th, 1951, and passed on October 18th, 2020. Alberto Quintella was a man of faith and a man of the law. We worked together in the Minnesota Attorney General's office when I first came to St. Paul. He was with me at the very beginning of my political career during my test run for mayor in 1989 when the size of my team was less than the number of digits on one's fingers or toes. And he was with me when I got elected mayor in 1993. I like Lori and I remember him being by Lori's side during some very contentious political gatherings in those early days. He was a protector. Being a conservative Democrat and then becoming a Republican didn't earn you many friends in St. Paul politics in the 90s and that and Latino into the mix. But Alberto Quintella never once wavered from being at my side. I admired his courage, appreciated his service, and I greatly, greatly valued his friendship. I was proud to have him as part of my administration during my early days as mayor. And I admired his service to the state of Minnesota in the Department of Human Rights and the Department of Commerce and then as Chief Deputy Secretary of State. I often called upon him during my time as United States Senator for counsel on issues that impacted the Chicano Latino community, which was so close to his heart. Alberto was a magnificent public servant with a brilliant legal mind and a heart of gold. He was steadfast and loyal, a remarkable man who despite his lofty educational achievements and high profile public positions, never ever forgot where he came from. He loved the West Side, he loved the St. Paul, he loved the state of Minnesota. And the folks of the West Side, the immigrant community, the people of St. Paul and the North Star State lost a champion when he passed. Alberto was a man of deep faith and spirituality. It informed his humanity, I'm uncertain, sustained him in his path forward in life as things became more difficult and uncertain. Those who knew Alberto, who cared for him, who loved him and lifted him up, never forgot nor will ever forget that the light of the man who passed into the night was the brightest during times of darkness. My life has been enriched by having known Alberto Quintella. His friendship was a gift that I have treasured. I valued his counsel, I am deeply saddened by his passing, but I am thankful and sustained to have been able to call him a dear, dear friend. Rest in peace, amigo. I mourn his passing. Respectfully submitted, Senator Norm Coleman. May it please the court, my name is Greg Johnson. Larry Rockford and I were good friends and colleagues for greater than 35 years. Larry Rockford was the embodiment of the phrase, hail fellow, well met. He was a big man, big frame, big appetites, big personality from a big family, expressing big emotions with big accomplishments and a big heart. Larry was born into a family of five siblings and grew up as a Catholic boy in Edina. He attended Benal St. Margaret's High School and St. John's University and graduated in 1980. After college, he attended law school at Hamlin University, graduating in 1983. His first job out of school was at West Publishing until he landed his dream job as an associate at Jardine Logan O'Brien in 1985. Larry aspired to be and became a great trial lawyer. 
and JLO was the perfect place for him to pursue that ambition. He was a partner at JLO for greater than 25 years and in the year prior to his death was with the Lohman Abdo firm. Larry was an aggressive advocate on behalf of his clients and approached his work with the happy warrior attitude that won over his friends and foes alike. His most important honor, of course, was the admiration and respect of his professional colleagues. On Larry's Facebook page, another attorney noted Larry was, quote, a good man, a good lawyer, a rare combination, end quote. While his career was important, nothing was more important than spending time with his family. He was married to Beth at the age of 41 and immediately embraced family life with the full gusto that he was known for. His two children, Lauren and David, soon followed and became the object of Larry's love, his affection and support. He was her biggest fan. He supported them in school and taught them the value of hard work. He attended every sporting event without fail. His children never doubted whether they had the approval and support of their father. He spread his affection and support to all of the children in the extended family. He loved all the many family vacations, but his all-time favorite was a trip to Hawaii. He enjoyed fishing almost anywhere, casting a reel with David, deep sea fishing in Costa Rica, salmon fishing in Alaska, as well as the annual fishing trips to Canada. He even had one mounted, a 42-inch northern pike. Larry was hospitalized with COVID-19 in mid-November but improved and was sent home the evening before Thanksgiving. Larry loved good food, and his last supper was a home-cooked Thanksgiving dinner with all the trimmings. Larry and his family then sat down, as with tradition, and watched the 2020 National Dog Show. He died later that evening. Larry was taken from us far too soon, and I will miss my friend. As Larry's cousin wrote, we sadly say goodbye to a big, gentle giant, a man who carried a smile on his face, a joke in his pocket, and lots of love for everyone in his heart. Larry, your big heart will live on forever in our hearts. Respectfully submitted, Mike Black and Greg Johnson. May it please the court. My name is Zach Sheehan, the grandson of Mike Sheehan an esteemed trial attorney, revered family man, and longtime St. Paul resident who passed away on May 17th, 2020. Although no amount of words can do it justice, I'm humbled to give this memorial of Mike's wonderful and accomplished life. Those of us who are closest to Mike remember him for his infectious smile and bottomless wisdom, which filled our lives with joy and insight. Though he is now gone, the spirit of Mike's legacy continues to impart feelings of comfort and understanding in this otherwise incomprehensible world, serving as our compass when we are lost and our inspiration when motivation wanes. Mike was born and raised in St. Paul by his parents, Louis and Evelyn Sheehan. Louis was the St. Paul city attorney and director of laws for St. Paul. Mike graduated from the St. Thomas Military Academy in 1951 and then after went on to receive his undergraduate degree from the University of Minnesota. After graduating from college, Mike went on to serve in the U.S. Army 1st Cavalry Division from 1955, where he also played on the Army's baseball team. Afterwards, he returned home and graduated with a law degree from the University of Minnesota in 1961. Mike's legal career started with a bang. He tried and won 21 cases in his first month as a practicing lawyer an unintelligible proposition for recently licensed lawyers like myself. Mike then went on to spend the next 40 years running a successful law practice where his fierce competitiveness and devotion to his clients resulted in countless victories. Having practiced law for coming up on two years, I now realize just how rare Mike's passion for his profession was. I've met hundreds, if not thousands of lawyers, yet none of them is as proud or devoted to the law as my grandfather was. His passion inspired me to seek a career in the law, to become the fourth generation lawyer in my family, and to pursue the lofty goal of continuing Mike's legacy. Apparently, others noticed Mike's passion too, for his career was marked by many accolades, such as being named to the super lawyers list by his peers, being recognized as a civil trial specialist, and being selected as one of the first deans of the Academy of Certified Trial Lawyers. 
Mike's mountainous perfect passion for the law was exceeded only by his love and passion for his wife of fifth, more than 59 years, Charlene, and their three sons, John, Mark, and Steve. Those that grew up in Minnesota's capital city rarely leave by choice. So when the time came for Mike and Charlene to start a family of their own, they chose St. Paul as the place to plant their roots. Well, by that point, Mike was by all accounts an established attorney. Mike's family was always his top priority. In fact, Mike's impressive trial record was second only to that of his son's little league baseball teams, which he coached and led to several league championships. Mike was a lifelong sports fan. Char learned this early on when Mike snuck out of their wedding reception on several occasions to check the score of the 1960 NCAA football championship, which his beloved Golden Gophers won on the night of his nuptials, a story he gleefully told with a smirk on his face for years to come. Right up until his passing, Mike and Char can be seen at the 50-yard line cheering on the Golden Gopher football team at every home game. Ralph Waldo Emerson once said, for every minute you're angry, you lose 60 seconds of happiness. Mike, who served as president of the St. Paul Optimist Club and Lieutenant Governor of Optimist International, embodied this sentiment and embraced life's many challenges with a smile on his face. From the courtroom to his family's kitchen, Mike's contagious positive energy radiated and uplifted every room he entered. There are many ways to define success. However, to me, the purest definition of succeed is to have left the world a little bit better than you found it, to know that just one life was made easier by your presence. In this regard and in many others, Mike's life was extraordinarily successful. He touched and impacted the lives of all those fortunate enough to be associated with him. We are all better people for having known him and his legacy will live on in our family, in his community and in the halls of the institutions he dedicated his life to. He will be greatly missed. Respectfully submitted, Zachary M. Sheehan. If it pleases the court, my name is Steve Kirsch and it is my honor to talk about Robert T. Bob White, my dear friend and partner. Bob was born on July 20, 1930 in Lakeville, Minnesota to Bud and Louise White. He is survived by nine children, 22 grandchildren, 16 great-grandchildren, and five siblings. He is preceded in death by his infant son, Robert, and his beloved wife, Joe. Bob and Joe were married in 1952 and raised their family in St. Paul. It was quite a family. How they both remembered names and dates most of the time with all the moving parts was amazing. Bob graduated from Lakeville High School in 1949 and from the College of St. Thomas in 1957. After serving as a medic in the Air Force stationed in Lockbourne, Ohio, it was on to William Mitchell College of Law in 1961. Bob practiced at the Murnan Law Firm in St. Paul, where he remained until his retirement in 1997. Throughout his career, he evinced a unique style of competitive collegiality that attracted a nationally prized client base, as well as admission into the American College of Trial Lawyers. This competitive collegiality ultimately became his character, reputation, and legacy. He was revered and respected as much by his adversaries as by his partners and clients. Bob was a true trial lawyer. For those who had the honor of trying jury trials with him, as I did on several occasions, it was an education that would make any law school envious. As serious and professional as Bob was, he went out of his way to treat the younger lawyers with kindness. Bob's honesty and sincerity had an ab uh, impact on juries. One of the first cases I second chaired with Bob, he actually cried during his closing argument. Two young plaintiffs, husband and wife, had tragically died in an accident, and it was our client's fault. His tears were real. Bob's honesty and sincerity was true. He suggested an amount to the jury, and that amount was awarded to the penny. I traveled on many business trips with Bob, actually with more with him than any lawyer in the office. Going on marketing trips with him was a true education. This man knew how to work a crowd. And on these trips, 
He loved reading hardback books. He was a voracious reader and a very educated individual. Bob was not a great joke teller, but he enjoyed hearing jokes as well as anyone. I, I can recall on a few occasions that smiling Irish face turning red after a few of my punchlines. He was very proud of his wife, Jo, when she undertook the incredibly difficult task of working on calligraphy project for the St. John's Bible. He was proud of his children. He was proud of his family, his law partners. And like my other mentors at the firm, he was proud to be a lawyer. He took ethics and the law profession seriously. As a young lawyer, I was very fortunate that Bob allowed me to get involved in large cases that would allow me to get experience, but also handle the cases myself. The training and confidence he showed me and other young lawyers at the Renan firm helped accelerate our careers by giving us more responsibility. I observed him doing the same things with his own family. For all of the people that love Bob in the law firm, in his church, in his family, and in the legal community, his friends, he will forever be missed. He was a wonderful man and a terrific lawyer, and we all wish him Godspeed. Respectfully submitted, Steve Kirsch. May it please the court. I'm Judge George Stevenson, Ramsey County District Court, the second judicial district. Gary Robert Wolf passed away on June 20th of 2020 after a six year battle with kidney cancer. Gary is survived by the women he loved the most, his daughter, Madeline, his wife, Jennifer, former spouse, Sissy, and stepdaughter, Emily. Born in West Point, New York on April 2nd, 1953, Gary grew up in Golden Valley, Minnesota. He put himself through college at the University of Minnesota and then attended Hamlin Law School where he graduated first in his class in 1981. After law school, Gary enlisted in the US Navy. He was lead counsel for 19 nuclear submarines at Pearl Harbor while serving as a Navy JAG officer. After leaving Hawaii, he continued to serve in the Navy reserves. His friend and commanding officer in the reserves, the late Judge Thomas Pock of Dakota County District Court, described Gary as, quote, the finest Navy and Marine lawyer who ever served under my command, close quote. Over the span of 39 years, Gary built his own successful criminal defense practice here in Minnesota. Gary chose the legal profession because he wanted to fight injustice and believe that everyone deserved fairness in our legal system. Gary also worked with the Criminal Justice Act panel for 25 years, representing approximately 160 people who could not afford counsel. Gary's dedication earned him numerous accolades and the respect of those with whom he worked. He felt privileged to work with so many talented lawyers throughout his career. He was known for his thorough preparation, knowledge of the law, and his deference toward those with whom he shared the courtroom. Outside of the courtroom, Gary was known for his quick wit, his generosity, and his love of animals. His impressive Hawaiian tattoos testified to his love of Hawaii. Gary was a passionate legal advocate, but as he would often say, his proudest achievement was being a father to his daughter, Madeline. He thoroughly enjoyed his job as dad. He cherished their adventures and travels they were able to share together in Egypt, Ireland, Germany, and France. He was immensely proud of Maddie's academic career, most recently as a PhD student at Harvard. Gary and Jen were married in 2015 after many years together. Jen had two children of her own with her youngest, Emily, finishing up middle school. They have such fond memories um, that they shared as a family. Gary and Emily became very close throughout Emily's high school years. Those two enjoyed spending time together and having fun, often at Jen's expense. We are so grateful, they said. Gary was able to share in the pride and joy of seeing Emily's virtual high school graduation in early June and learning of her acceptance to the University of Minnesota Duluth. 
a paragon of dedication to the legal profession and to his loved ones, Gary was one of a kind and he is greatly missed. And I would like to add my own comment. I had Gary in my courtroom dozens, if not hundreds of times. It was always a joy to see his face walk into my courtroom or walk into chambers because I knew I was going to be dealing with a knowledgeable, prepared professional. And he always made me laugh. I miss him, as does everybody here. And uh, this is respectfully submitted by Madeline Wolf and Jennifer Wolf and Judge George Stevenson. Rest in peace, Gary. I want to thank all the presenters here today and on behalf of the Ramsey County Bench and the Bar Association, I want to thank all those who attended. Let us leave this course session now reflecting on the lives of those that gave so much to so many. Please stay safe. And now the deputy will call this session to a close. The special session of the district court is herewith adjourned. <laughs>